Good morning, everybody. Welcome to um, Confed Expo and to the HSN Network Mini Theatre Sessions. Um, our first session this morning um, is the business case to champion diversity and inclusion in healthcare innovation. And we've got four fantastic speakers for you this morning. We have Richard Stubbs, Vice Chair of the HSN Network and Chief Executive of Yorkshire and Humber AHSN. We've got Suzanne Halley Hassan, who is Deputy Director of the National Innovation Accelerator and Director of Enterprise at UCL Partners. We have Malone McQuende, who is founder of Black and Brown Skin. And last but not least, we have Leslie Solden, who is Program Director of Innovation at the Health Innovation Network. Um, I will now hand over to Richard, who's going to, uh, to lead the session. Thanks, Tim. Um, morning, everyone. Oh, wow. That's uh, interesting. Can you all hear me okay? Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for being here and not listening to Amanda's keynote speech. Um, I'm going to pause while anybody who realizes or hasn't realized that the missing Amanda just leaves the room, you'll be forgiven. Um, now, this is, um, this is a really important topic for us at the HSN Network, and I'm really glad that you've prioritized it. So thank you for that. We're really grateful. Um, I'm going to speak very briefly. I'm basically the warm-up man for three fantastic speakers today, but I wanted to just talk to you in, in general terms about what we're doing in terms of this agenda, why we're doing it, why it's really important to us. Um, so I think we'll start with the fact that um, I, I kind of had this light bulb, embarrassing light bulb moment um, in about 2018, 19, when I realized that having been in the NHS in senior levels now for 20 years and always worked on the equality, diversity, innovation issues, uh, inclusion issues, I should say, and now having had a role in innovation for a number of years, I hadn't really put those two agendas together. So in the NHS, we often think about in inclusion and diversity with respect to our leadership teams, and we think about it also with respect to our frontline staff. But I realized we hadn't really had a conversation about what it means for our innovation and our research ecosystems. And as the ASN Network, we probably had to have a leadership role in that. And then, of course, with Core 20 Plus 5, which came along a couple of years later, that also, I think, gave us an increased momentum, appetite, and interest within the health system to think, how do we deliver care differently? And for us, of course, in the ASN Network, what do we do to ensure our innovations are reducing and not increasing health inequalities? So um, I always think it's um, uh, necessary to put this picture up. This is um, our great set of volunteers across the ASN Network. So what we did was we started with ourselves. I was very keen that we wanted to spend the first 18 to 24 months on this journey really understanding the role that we played as the ASN Network, what our influencers were, who we influenced in terms of our gatekeeping roles, so things like access onto the NHS Innovation Accelerator, but also in terms of the innovations that we sought to deploy, who were the communities that we were deploying them to, and also um, where were those innovations coming from. And I think that led us to a number of um, different thoughts, but in particular, this thinking around the fact that um, we had a huge amount of influence um, to play in the diversity agenda if we really started to think about our work in more broad terms. Um, we did a report in 2019, which really was my way of throwing my cap over the wall in terms of promising to take this agenda very seriously and hold ourselves accountable to it. In that report, we celebrated our innovators from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. We talked about how their lived experience gave them um, an interesting insight into how to get innovations that reached our seldom heard communities. But probably most important of all, we developed a series of pledges. And those pledges were things that we held ourselves to account on as individual HSNs and of course across our network. And the pledges were designed to be a series of um, promises that we made to ourselves and to our innovation communities about how we were as employers, how we were in terms of our staffing, but most importantly, the influence that our programs had and how we would seek to put things like equality impact assessments into our thinking about the delivery of national programs, how we would seek to ensure that we celebrated and championed diverse innovators both inside and outside the NHS. One of the things I'm particularly keen on saying is that the NHS has, and this by the way is not just strictly about race, but we started there, 20% of our staff in the NHS identify as BAME. If we don't ensure that all our 1.4 million staff have access to our innovation pipeline and ecosystem, that's one-fifth of our future ideas that we're simply turning our back on. 
And that's a statement that I say quite often, and that, I suppose, encapsulates for me what we're doing on this journey. So I'm really pleased and proud to say that all the HSNs came on board with this journey with us. And we now sit here almost exactly two years on since I was writing that first report um, in a tent in Wales. Um, uh, I haven't got that picture. Um, but what we're starting to see now are the case studies from the work that we've done, and I think particularly how the pledges have changed our thinking for the better, helped us to identify where we've been going wrong in some occasions in the past, but perhaps most importantly and most optimistically, really start to think about how we accelerate the HSN Network's leadership, not just in terms of um, diversity and inclusion, but ultimately how innovation starts to reduce and not widen health inequalities. So numbers of case studies in our report, and that new report is being released today. Um, we're not going to make a big fanfare about it um, today because um, we know we'll get drowned out in presumably what Amanda's saying as we speak. So from next week onwards, um, there'll be a lot of social media about it and we'll be pushing it out to everyone. So I would encourage you to please download the report. Um, I've got to give a huge shout out to Jane in the back, actually. Give us a wave, Jane, um, who has done so much work to get this report off the ground. And I think one of the things to say is that this isn't um, a piece of work that's had a huge amount of funding um, from the HSN network or from other partners. This is us putting literally £15,000 together from the 15 HSN, so £1,000 each, and a team of incredibly um, valued volunteers who have come together to deliver this. And I think we've delivered a lot with a little. And one of the things that I'm very keen on next is starting to think, so that was our starting point, but what can we do more? What's our next part of this journey? As I said, I wanted to spend the first two years thinking about ourselves, but now I want to think about the entire ecosystem across the NHS and wider into health and care more generally. So I'm not going to go through our learnings in detail, but they're there and they're there in the report. As I said, a huge amount of learning for this report, but we continue to grow and we continue to learn. And most importantly now, I need to stop speaking so you can hear from people who are actually out there doing it. So I think uh, Susie is going to take us on with the NHS Innovation Accelerator. Susie. Thank you, Richard. Um, good morning, everybody. So um, I'm lovely to see you all. I'm the new Deputy Director of the National Innovation Accelerator. For those unfamiliar with the NIA, we're a, a national program delivered in partnership with the AHSN for scaling well evidence and on-market innovations. We're here today, so if you want to find out any more, we're happy to talk to you. Much of what I'm going to um, talk through today uh, actually preceded me joining the NIA, but I'm delighted that we have both our programme manager and communications and engagement manager with us who can answer any specific questions that I may not be able to. Um, so to begin with, um, looking at the, the challenge, so we were really, really delighted at the diversity pledges which were published by the HSN Network in 2020, highlighting uh, both BAME -A -E, and female um, successes and, and recognising the breadth of innovation and the need within the community. Um, it, it, it required us to really look at our figures and actually one of the statistics we pulled out was that since the NIA was launched in 2015, only about 35% of applicants, for example, were female, um, which is very low for a programme that's been running for seven years. So, so it did make us think. And then alongside that post-pandemic and with the publishing of, of the challenges in health inequalities, we recognised we wanted the NIA innovations really to, to, to address those challenges and to ensure that they were um, uh, positively addressing equality and also um, health inequalities within our system. So what did we do? Um, so the NIA team consulted EQIA experts um, to really better understand the problem as well as hosted focus groups with female innovators and innovators with a BAME background um, to, to really understand how they perceived the NIA program, how they really understood um, um, the, the, the offer that was laid out to them and any, any tweaks that we might want to wake and how the NIA was um, promoted and, and displayed. Consequently, we began to highlight female and BAME successes and stories through the NIA programme and through the HSN network. Um, and we also considered language that was, was used within our application form um, and also um, uh, some of the, the guidance documents. There were key, key phrases and key words like um, exceptional that were highlighted as actually really deterring female applicants in particular from applying to, to the programme. 
Um, we then also looked at that potential bias in the process. Um, so, so this was um, really to, to, to better understand how, how potential interviewers may, may bring with them unconscious bias to the interview process and how we might alleviate that, um, among some other things. So the impact, we were really pleased to see that actually since 2020, the number of BAME applicants increased by 108%, which is really, really significant. So it's very much well done to, to the engagement team and the NIA programme for working hard to engage with the Shuri Network um, and other focus groups that, um, that helped us uh, raise that number. There was less of a raise in the number of female applicants. Um, it was much more subtle, but we think it's because we did probably focus quite a bit on looking at increasing more diversity from, from people from different ethnic backgrounds. Um, but we were quite pleased with that. And I think starting really from bottom up, what we will continue to do is monitor that recruitment data. I think it's really, really important and, and certainly to align with the, the evolution of, of the HSN network pledges. Um, we also want to work as a programme to increase the diversity in the pool of applicants. It was great that the pool of applicants from BAME communities increased, but actually them being accepted onto the programme was less, based purely on their maturity, the maturity of the innovation, their readiness for the programme. So how do we work pre-NIA to support those applicants to get ready and the, the technologies to be, um, to be uh, more ready for scale? Um, and then also, while on the programme, successful fellows will be supported to, to complete an EQIA assessment. So that's really, so from the beginning, they understand the potential um, impact their innovation has on both diversity and health inequalities, and where throughout the programme, we might be able to support them raise that level of evidence um, and ensure that actually it's, it's part of their business case for working um, and being adopted by the NHS. So that's all I wanted to say to you today. There's, there's great other examples um, coming along. Do you come and speak to us if you'd like to find out more about the programme. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. um, I'm just trying to figure out whether I need to use my mummy voice or not. I'm just... Because <laughs> can you hear at the back? Can I just check? because I don't want it to go all squeaky. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm Leslie Susan. I'm the Programme Director of Innovation at the Health Innovation Network, which is the AHSN for South London. Um, and um, I'm gonna talk to you about a commission piece of work that we were delivered at the Health Innovation Network to deliver. My background is a weird mixture of working in innovation, so working at the AHSN for the last four and a half years, um, a strategy and business development, but previously I was a diversity and inclusion lead for about seven years in a central London community trust. And the lack of progress meant that I moved on. I decided, I tried, I banged my head, there was a big hole in the wall. And so the, the health inequalities agenda has been really interesting to see how it got raised in COVID. And you may have been aware that the Race Observatory did a rapid review about pulse oximeters and being not as accurate in um, people, patients with darker skin and affecting the clinical decision making of whether someone actually gets admitted with COVID or not. So there was, on the back of that, they commissioned us to look at how our equality impact assessments used. It's not, it's not really the sexiest subject, but it's one of the most important because when um, rolling out any kind of um, innovation, so that could be medical device, it could be digital, it could be a point of care testing, you need to be able to look at whether there are creating any inequalities based upon race or gender. So we, I'm not gonna go into too much detail. Um, we, we basically looked at what was out there. We were trying to find good practice and I searched high and dry, I searched everywhere for an equality impact assessment that had been produced and published when a provider or a commissioner or a national body in the NHS had commissioned, had commissioned uh, particularly around digital, and I couldn't find anything. Local authorities, there's only one from local authorities, slightly better. But we also did some research. So um, we asked, um, we had an online survey. We went out both to industry and to NHS stakeholders because we wanted to find out what did our industry partners do. So those innovators that had been getting commissioned had been implementing. Um, and we also um, did some stakeholder interviews. 
with um, a mixture of CIOs, um, the health inequalities team from NHS England, some of those innovators that had been asked to do equality impact assessments, um, and we gathered all that information together and we produced a report. But also, more importantly, the report can just go and sit on the virtual shelf. What the Race Observatory asked us to do was to come up with a set of proposed standards, like a checklist, so anyone, doesn't matter whether you're an industry partner or an NHS stakeholder or a local authority, if you are commissioning or implementing an innovation, you can use the checklist to go through. Because, for example, um, there's certain clinical criteria that may transfer over into medical devices. So I'll give you an example, um, alongside the pulse oximeters, which is, there's an independent review going on at the moment. Um, there's also with uh, kidney function tests. Only nine months ago, NICE changed their guidance for the scoring to reduce the score if a patient for the kidney function test was from a black Caribbean background, um, which created, again, inaccuracies in diagnosing chronic kidney disease. So if that was to transfer over, we also know some of the AI complications. And, we, and in the report, there were some really good recommendations we got out from um, a, um, I won't say who they are, but they're a National Cancer Trust, so it probably gives it away, who, who have, they've implemented a lot of AI. And their CIO is always looking, how do you make sure those algorithms aren't perpetuating bias? How do you make sure that the data sets have a representative how do you make sure the clinical trials on any innovation that they're putting in are representative? Because I don't know if you know, but the, the UK Biobank that's used for a lot of precision medicine, um, it's 95% based on white participants. So you're missing a whole section of the population, but it's also mainly older women. Quite unusual. Clinical trials tend to be more male biased. So um, within the standards, we hopefully, we think it's a good checklist for anyone to go through to be able to do that. So some of the findings that we got were that at all stages, any bias or inequalities, and really doing that sort of asking the questions. So if you're an NHS stakeholder, asking the right questions, where's your data set from? How representative is it? Often there's a lot of country, um, there's a lot of data sets that are used in other countries. Are they representative of the UK? Um, but what we, we found overall that the equality impacts as a tool are useful, but they do need to be um, simpler and they need to make sure they're done combined. And also, I don't know if anyone, has, how many people have done an equality impact assessment? Hands up. Okay. Did the actions that you put in there get followed up? Did the mitigations that you put in? Okay. So it's also incredibly important that any mitigations are also are actually actioned and I'm really pleased to hear from Richard about the national programs always having equality impact assessments because I do remember when I came into the H Centre I was, I was surprised that there wasn't equality impact assessments done systematically on some of our national and our regional programs and then the last one is around um, as, uh, where I talked about the AI solutions and I thought this was a great idea that came from the CIO about having a governance board to look at the algorithms, people that understand how algorithms work, not someone like me, I have no idea how algorithms work, but you check them, you ask the right questions and you check them annually to make sure that any AI that's been introduced. Um, so please come and find me, ask me any questions, really, there's, there were so many findings. The 6th of July, I wasn't allowed to launch it today by the, the NHS Race and Health Observatory. They want to launch it on the 6th of July. So um, please do have a look at the report and have a look, use the checklist as well. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you so much to Susie and Leslie and Richard. Um, and now I'm just going to talk a little bit about maybe an example of some of the work that they have kind of spoke about from like a policy level. So my name is Malone, I'm the founder of Black and Brown Skin, and we essentially are a company that is aiming to provide culturally competent healthcare for black and people of color. So this is a statistic which currently exists. Um, it might have even got worse over the years. Um, to say only 4.5% of images in medical textbooks show skin of color essentially. And in that 4.5%, usually the conditions which are depicted are things such as sexually transmitted diseases, but something as simple as eczema or acne will be like really hard to come about. So I noticed this when I first got to medical school and 
I noticed it from a point of observation as opposed to a point of like looking and going and doing the research. And one thing that I knew for sure at the time was that I was just flicking through the textbooks, but I knew that I wouldn't be able to diagnose myself if I was to use this textbook. And it would used to be so concerning to me that I would ask final year medical students, junior doctors, and they also didn't have the same confidence on diagnosing things like acne or eczema when it came to just someone with darker skin. And of course, that's a problem. So I decided to take matters into my own hands. Um, just out of curiosity, has anybody heard about Mind the Gap? Um, if you have, can you put your hands up? Okay, amazing. There's some people in the room who have. Um, so this essentially was a project which I started. At the time, it was just to be able to change my clinical department at my university. Since then, it spiraled into 400, 400,000 people in more than 75% of the countries worldwide. Essentially accessing and seeing that actually when you put two pictures side by side, that they don't always look the same. Of course, to some people, they'll say that, oh, well, clinical presentation, signs and symptoms like on the charts will be the same. However, that almost bias that somebody may have can be the difference between life and death. And we know that medicine essentially is a game, sometimes of very fine margins. So since launching the book, um, it has impacted curricular change at many universities up and down the country and in other countries as well, Germany and the USA notably. And it's also impacted policy change in the NHS 111 system. So for anyone who is a person of color, if they've ever called 111, they've probably noticed that you'll get asked the question at some point along the journey, like, are your lips going blue? Um, and nine times out of 10, there is no answer to that question. And um, being from a medical background, that could be the difference between someone being rushed into hospital versus someone being left at home. So the NHS 111 have reviewed their um, calling system to make some of their questions more inclusive and be able to essentially inform people of what to look for even when they have darker skin tones. And more importantly for me, I think the people at home are the ones who feel represented. They feel like they can answer the questions and they feel like their healthcare isn't being um, almost receiving less of a service simply because of the color of their skin. Um, and from doing everything that I did with Mind the Gap, it made me realize this is some pictures from the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020. Um, it made me realize that racism is a public health crisis simply because, um, like was mentioned earlier, if you leave out 20% of the population on innovation, you leave out a lot of people and ideas. Um, and I think it's so important because in black and brown communities, there is a deep mistrust that exists with healthcare systems. Um, little things such as, for instance, I grew up hearing things such as when you go to the doctors, make sure you over exaggerate your pain because you're not going to be seen if you don't over exaggerate it. And for many black and brown people up and down the country, that is a very normal thing. Um, and it all kind of stems from the medical side as well as a mistrust in the communities that we serve. So where I am today, um, Mind the Gap was kind of how I got into this space. Today, um, we are currently working on a community platform where at the moment we have 3,100 black and brown people talking about their skin. We also have been sponsored by Neutrogena, which is a Johnson & Johnson owned skincare brand, um, essentially to help highlight the amount of disparities that exist with black and brown communities when it comes to talking about their skin. One thing that was very important for me was that I kind of go straight to the people who need it as opposed to almost going to hospitals and medical institutions because I felt like there was a lot of resistance on that side, but the people in the community are almost dying for a solution. Um, and it was very important for me to be just able to put healthcare in people's hands. So today it's only a community platform just to kind of prove of concepts, get people on board. But tomorrow where we would like to go, um, and this is version version one um, of our prototype of our app, so it looks nothing like this. Um, but I essentially want to build a virtual hospital for black and brown people to be able to access healthcare. As I mentioned, putting people and the community first, I think it's very important when you're doing anything with health inequalities that you start with the people um, and not sit in boardrooms and decide what the people want, just go out into the community and literally ask them. Um, and in the process of this, I hope it will rebuild the trust that black and brown people have with healthcare and just medicine as a whole. And I think we can rebuild that trust if we just put them at the center of everything. Um, and then this is, essentially our core mission. Um, we just want to be able to educate and empower. And 
empower the next generation of black and brown people from both a healthcare side and from both a policy side. Um, one thing that is very important for me is community. Um, I know a lot of ethnic minority people in the room um, today understand the importance of community and where we kind of come from. Community is always at the center of everything that we do. Um, so it's so important for me that that is like the building principle of everything that we're doing. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I will be around. So if anybody wants to ask any questions, um, feel free to catch me up or you can connect with me on LinkedIn. And more importantly, please do visit our website. Um, we're on a mission to essentially change health outcomes for black and brown people. Thank you so much. Brilliant, breathtaking. Hopefully that's given you an inspirational start to Confed Expo. Um, you might not see anything as inspirational as that in the next two days, but um, thank you so much for that story. Please do grab him when we've finished. I'm sure a lot of you will be wanting to speak more about that and how we can support. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, a nice little start to your day, hopefully. Um, for us in the ACN Network, we're not ending the journey here. Our next report comes out um, next week, although you can get it now if you scan on the QR code. Read about our case studies, what we've learned so far. But I think more importantly, we've refreshed our pledges to make them less HSN centric and more adoptable and adaptable by anybody. So what I want to do is not have everyone in the life science industry, policy, government level, HSNs, people in healthcare directly, inventing their own things. I think what we want to do is have a social movement where we all say, these are the things that are really important to us when it comes to equality, diversity, inclusion, and innovation. Let's build a vehicle and do it all together. So for me, that's the next two years of this project. How can we get more people on the bandwagon? How can we make it much bigger than the work we've done here in the HSN Network? So please do have a look and try and pledge your support, either by adopting and adapting the pledges in your own working space and or by coming to us and letting you know how you can lend your support in other ways. So thank you to our speakers once again. Thank you for listening and have a great day. Thanks.